Serial Killer Saturdays. Catherine Wilson. Suspected Killings. Six. Welcome to the launch of a new series we are trialling called Serial Killer Saturdays. In this series, we will be focusing in depth on a serial killer from British history. The stories are based on publications of their day. In today's episode, we are in 1862, looking at serial killer Catherine Wilson, a nurse with a perchance for poison. She would convince her patients to leave money for her in their wills and would conveniently die afterwards. Catherine was not particular in who she killed or attempted to kill. Partners and friends were all open game to her. Her sentencing judge described her as the greatest criminal that ever lived. We hope you enjoy the show. Catherine Wilson was born in 1822 and hanged on the 20th of October, 1862. Catherine must have had considerable charm as she managed to get away with murder the first time. Whilst the first trial had been underway, police had been busy and had exhumed her other suspected victims. The autopsies proved them all to have died of poisoning. Catherine was then re-arrested immediately and tried for a different murder and again for poisoning. What is especially interesting in this case is the length of time before she got caught. She was actually eventually convicted of a murder she had committed six years prior. Her most recent murder, which had ended in a not guilty verdict, led the police to look more closely into Catherine's past. We have few details of Catherine's early life. She has been described from Harper's Weekly on the 20th of November, 1862. On Monday, October the 20th, Catherine Wilson met a doom as righteous as human law ever inflicted on a criminal whose deeds quite equal the atrocities of any malefactor on record. From the age of 14 to that of 43, her career was one of undeviating yet complex vice. Catherine Wilson was as foul in life as bloody in hand, and she seemed not to have spared the poison draught even to the partners of her adultery and sensuality. Catherine's crimes were outlined in the broadsides, one penny single sheet papers handed out on execution day. These papers were just in financial reach of the poorer population. From our research, there are some discrepancies with dates and also Catherine's actual relationship with her many victims. Some papers refer to the males who died as her paramours. Others refer to Catherine's position as either a nurse or a domestic servant. We recount the paper articles as they appeared. There are some slight discrepancies within the various papers. From the Broadsides, 1862, this morning, the Old Bailey was again a scene of excitement, owing to the extreme sentence of the law being carried out on the body of Catherine Wilson, a criminal of the most horrible class. It will be recollected that the prisoner was tried last at the Old Bailey Sessions for the murder of Maria Soames by poison in 1855, who resided in one of her own houses in Alfred Place, Fitzroy Square, for which crime she was found guilty and has now suffered the extreme penalty of the law. Peter Morn, 1853. It appears that about the year 1853, the prisoner employed as a domestic servant as a person named Morn, 
who lived in Boston in Lincolnshire, and that this person was in habit of taking colchicum. He made his will in the month of April, and by that will he left her the whole of the little property he possessed. He died in the month of October following. James Dixon, common law husband, 1856. In the year 1856, we find that she was living with a young man named Dixon, and that they came to London and went to lodge with Mrs. Soames. Dixon was suddenly taken ill with violent vomiting and purging, and his systems were exactly the same as those exhibited by the unfortunate woman, Mrs. Soames. Dixon died shortly afterwards. The prisoner, Catherine Wilson, herself declared that he died of rapid consumption, but on his body being opened, his lungs were found perfectly healthy. Mrs. Jackson, 1851 About the year 1851, we find that she, Catherine Wilson, was in the habit of visiting a Mrs. Jackson, who resided at Boston in Lincolnshire. Catherine was aware that Mrs. Jackson had drawn from the bank in that town a sum of £120, and that sum was in her possession. Mrs. Jackson was taken ill with the same symptoms and died in four days. After her death, the money was nowhere to be found. It appeared that on this occasion Catherine Wilson produced a promissory note apparently signed by two persons in Boston for the amount that was missing, £120, but it was proven that those signatures were forged. Mrs. Atkinson, October 1860 In the month of October 1860 we find that Catherine Wilson was connected with a Mrs. Atkinson who resided at Kirby Lawnsdale, and that Catherine came to live with her at her residence in Kennington. It appears that Catherine became aware that Mrs. Atkinson was in possession of a considerable sum of money. On the 19th of October, Mrs. Atkinson was taken ill. Again, it was the same symptoms of retching, violent purging, vomiting, and great agony, and in four days she was dead. If Catherine had been acquitted upon the charge of poisoning Mrs. Soames, she would have been tried for the murder of Mrs. Atkinson. Mr. Taylor, 1861. In 1861 we find she was living with a man named Taylor. He was attacked in the same manner, with the same symptoms of retching, violent purging, vomiting and great agony. Fortunately for him, remedies were immediately resorted to, and he recovered. The attempted murder that brought down Catherine Wilson was Mrs. Sarah Carnell, 1862. Catherine Wilson worked as a domestic servant, nursing the ill health of Mrs. Sarah Carnell. She made will, and by that she said that Mrs. Carnell left a sum of money to Catherine Wilson. Catherine brought her a soothing warm drink, urged Mrs. Carnell to drink it, stating, Drink it down, love. It will warm you. Mrs. Carnell took a taste and spat it out as it burned her mouth. It was noticed that a hole was burned into the carpet where the liquid had touched. Mrs. Carnell survived this murder attempt and police were called in. Tests were run and it was found that the soothing draught that Catherine had given Mrs. Carnell contained sulfuric acid in an amount enough to kill 50 people. Catherine escaped to London where she was caught and arrested. To the surprise of everyone, Catherine was found not guilty. Her defence that the acid must have been given to her by mistake from the pharmacist cast enough reasonable doubt for Catherine to be acquitted. However, police had been busy 
and Catherine was immediately re-arrested for the murder of Mrs. Soames. From the Broadsides, 1862. Again, we find that only in the present year, 1862, she was tried at Newgate for an attempted at murder by the administration of sulfuric to a woman in whose house she resided. She was acquitted upon this charge, but though this was the case, there is too much reason to believe she was guilty of this crime also. These facts, we regret to say, render it extremely probable that the startling statement by Dr. Taylor is correct, and that in the midst of apparent prosperity and obedience to the law, dreadful crime and vice is rife in the metropolis through the destruction of life by secret poisoning. The history of this wretched woman reveals a long career of crime, so secret and appalling that it is almost impossible to think of it without a shudder. A crime of this sort involves almost all of necessity, a certain amount of intimacy, if not of close friendship, between the murderer and the victim. The demon of destruction must stand at the bedside in the guise of a friend, watch the tortures inflicted with a simulated sympathy, and have the opportunity of repeating them. Till nature can bear no more, and the dreadful work is effectively done. These conditions are essential to the success of a single crime of this sort. But Catherine Wilson, who suffered death this day, had fulfilled these terrible conditions, had gone through these awful scenes, not only once, but over and over again, until she became, at length, a skilful, resolute, and pitiless adept in this diabolical arc of death. Within her narrow circle and up to the limit of her opportunities, she was the perfect Borgia or female Palmer. It was evidently the study of her life to multiply these opportunities. She moved quietly from place to place, from one circle to another, repeating at every change the same awful tragedy. In every instance, the victims were promptly selected, gradually folded with serpentine dexterity in the coils of a fatal intimacy, and the, the necessary poison of confidence and control, having once been secured, struck down with a stealthy and remorseless blow. The particular crime for which this guilty woman suffered was committed no less than six years ago, and, considering the long interval that has elapsed, and the great difficulty of obtaining definite proof in such cases, the evidence produced at the trial must be regarded as satisfactory and conclusive. It came out in the evidence that then prisoner, with a view probably to her own protection, circulated in confidence the report that the deceased Mrs. Soames had poisoned herself, and that she was privy to the fact, but did not wish to reveal. It was proved, however, that the poor woman, Mrs. Soames, as perfectly cheerful, in good health and spirits, with no motive whatever for committing such a desperate act, and he had in fact made arrangements during her short illness on the expectation of a speedy recovery. If she died by poison, as Catherine Wilson asserted, there could be no doubt as to whom had administered it. Motive The only point remaining to be noticed is the motive of the murder, and this, as in every case of poisoning by the same hand, appears to have been money. The prisoner, Catherine Wilson, knew that Mrs. Soames had gone to her brother for money and probably did not know how much she had actually received. 
But whatever it might be, she, Catherine Wilson, evidently resolved to possess herself of it, and accordingly no trace of the nine pounds in gold was found after Mrs. Soames's death. It appears uncertain whether she had not obtained other sums from the murdered woman. After Mrs. Soames's death, Catherine Wilson certainly obtained ten pounds from the daughters on the faith of a document said to be in their mother's handwriting. But it is perfectly clear that this wretched woman had become so familiar with the appalling crime of secret poisoning that the certain prospect of even a comparatively small prize would be quite sufficient to incite her to another attempt. The Trial From the Nonconformist October 1862 Several days were occupied at the Central Criminal Court last week in the trial of Catherine Wilson for the murder, by poison, of Mrs. Soames six years ago. She was found guilty and sentenced to death. Her case is interesting as exhibiting the depth of wickedness, of cunning and of criminal audacity to which woman's nature may sink. Eight years ago, Catherine Wilson was living as a housekeeper or servant with a gentleman who made his will in her favour and very shortly afterwards died. Whether he died by fair means or whether his death was accelerated by the object of his bounty will never be known. There appears to be no positive evidence of his having died of poison, and charity, if charity is worth bestowing upon such an object, would willingly acquit her of such a crime. The gentleman was accustomed to taking doses of colchicum. For our listeners, colchicum was used as a painkiller and anti-inflammatory medicine, but can be lethal if not taken under controlled dosages. So that his housekeeper knew perfectly well the mode of its operation. Left in moderate comfortable circumstances by the will in her favour, she seems to have devoted her life since that period to improving the fortune and practising the lessons she had obtained from her deceased benefactor by a system of the most wholesale poisoning. Mrs. Soames, the woman of whose murder this female palmer has just been convicted, kept a lodging house in London. To this home Mrs. Wilson came as lodger, together with a young man of the name of Dixon. They had not been there long before Dixon was taken seriously and suddenly ill. All the symptoms were those of poisoning by colchicum, and in a short time he died. His death certificate represented that he had died of consumption, but his lungs were found perfectly healthy. A short time afterwards, Mrs. Soames herself came home one evening with a loan of nine pounds in her pocket. It was dangerous to carry money in one's pocket when in company with Catherine Wilson. The landlady was well and in good spirits in the evening. Catherine Wilson wanted to see her in her room. She went there and stayed some time. The next morning Mrs. Soames was violently ill, again with the symptoms that would have been resulted from the use of colchicum. Medical assistance was called in. Catherine Wilson was indefatigable in her attentions. She gave her medicine, she gave her food, but the most soothing medicines and the most suitable food only seemed to aggravate the symptoms, and Mrs. Soames died. The nine pounds she had borrowed was not to be found while an IOU showed that she was indebted £10 to Catherine Wilson, that she should have borrowed £10 of Catherine Wilson, or that Catherine Wilson should have had £10 to lend her, were equally remarkable. But this was found. Catherine Wilson, as the affectionate friend, hinted that Mrs. Soames 
had taken poison. Indeed, her head seemed to be very full of poison. The doctor suspected poison too, but had not skill enough to prove it. Catherine Wilson, however, knew a cause why Mrs. Soames should have taken poison. There was a man who wanted to marry her and had jilted her. Nobody else knew the man, and he had never been produced. There was, however, a letter from him dating just before Mrs. Soames's death. That letter was proved to be in the handwriting of Catherine Wilson. Such facts as these, with other circumstances, ably summed up by the judge, left not a shadow of doubt that Catherine Wilson had committed the murder, stolen the money, forged the IOU for money lent, and fabricated the evidence by which she hoped to remove the guilt from her own shoulders. Three years later, in 1859, we find this interesting creature with a Mrs. Jackson at Boston. Mrs. Jackson had drawn £120 out of the bank and Catherine Wilson knew that she had drawn it. Mrs. Jackson was taken ill with the same symptoms as her former victims and died. The £120 could not be discovered and a promissory note which was found for the same signed by two pretended borrowers was proved to be a forgery. This sum seems to have set Catherine Wilson up, for next year we find her receiving lodgers, and one of these lodgers was a Mrs. Atkinson of Kirby Lonsdale, who, in a short time, exhibited the same symptoms as Mrs. Soames and the rest, and in a few days died. The evidence of murder in this case appears to have been very strong, for the prisoner was indicted upon it, and had she been acquitted, of the murder of Mrs. Soames would have been tried upon this charge. The judge, in passing sentence, expressed his firm assurance of her guilt. From Harper's Weekly, the 22nd of November, 1862, Mr. Justice Biles, with reference to the death of Miss Soames, stated, We never heard of a case in which it was more clearly proved that murder had been committed, and where the excruciating pain and agony of the victim was watched with so much deliberation by the murderer. Mr Justice Boyles went on to say that he had no more doubt but that Mrs Atkinson was also murdered by Catherine Wilson, that if he had seen the crime committed with his own eyes. Nor did two murders comprise the catalogue of her crimes, that she, who poisoned her paramour Moa, again poisoned a second lover, one Dixon, and robbed and poisoned Mrs. Jackson, attempted the life of a third paramour named Taylor, and administered sulfuric acid to a woman in whose house she was a lodger. Seven murders known, if not judicially proved, do not, after all, perhaps complete Catherine Wilson's evil career. The Execution from the Broadsides, 1862 The wretched creature had, within the last few days, become fully aware of her awful position and paid marked attention to the exhortations of the worth chaplain and seemed to give way to her evil conscience. She had been ever reserved with regard to the awful crime for which she suffered, but we believe she made some communications to the chaplain. She rose early on the morning and was attended by the chaplain when she continued in prayer for some time. She partook sparingly at breakfast, and at 7 a.m., the sheriffs arrived and immediately visited the wretched culprit who thanked them for the kindness she received at their hands. The executioner now proceeded to pinion the prisoner. When everything being in readiness, the prisoner thanked the officials for their attention. 
the procession was now formed and, headed by the chaplain, proceeded towards the scaffold. On arriving on the drop, the prisoner seemed dismayed at the immense multitude assembled who greeted her with groans and hisses. The preparations having been completed, the signal was given and the bolt drawn, and Catherine Wilson was launched into eternity. From the Bister Advertiser, Saturday, 22nd of November, 1862. The crowd, we should think, did not contain more than eight or ten thousand persons. A good many of the windows commanding a view of the scaffold were without tenants. We noticed that several well-dressed women were at some of the windows that were occupied, and that the opera glasses were being used in requisition, but certainly much less educated or genteel curiosity touching Calcraft's manipulations, and their results was manifested that had been displayed a month ago. It was said that four pounds was being asked for a room with three windows on the Ludgate hillside of the gallows. We wonder if the landlords of the houses near the scaffold claim any additional rent on the ground of the very peculiar advantages which their tenants enjoy. At midnight at least a hundred persons had taken up their position near the gallows with the view of remaining till all was over. It would not, we think, be any great libel on them to say that they were chiefly belonging to the classes who resided in the fetid court pointed out to Alton Lock by Sandy Mackay, thieves, prostitutes, or worse. Between seven and eight the crowd was very noisy. A band of preachers had taken up their stand on the Smithfield side of the scaffold, and in a style which resembled that of a Mr. Richard Weaver, loudly exhorted all within hearing to instant repentance. The crowd as a whole behaved neither better nor worse than any other crowd of the same description had done before. Catherine Wilson has the distinction of being the last woman to be publicly hanged in London. Hers was the first death sentence handed down to a woman in 14 years. It was noted that even the societies against execution made little noise against Catherine Wilson's sentence. That concludes this Serial Killer Saturday episode of Catherine Wilson. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. There is no cost to you, and it really helps to support us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you have not already subscribed. We have listened to our listeners' feedback, and we are working on increasing our longer episodes to four times a week. They will be uploaded Tuesdays, Wednesdays, with our new series we are launching, Whitechapel Wednesdays, Thursdays, and our new Serial Killer Saturdays. With shorter, but we believe still interesting stories uploaded on the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>